I've heard that a lifetime is 33 plus years. So I've heard. Um, so it means that I've known our messenger this morning for more than a lifetime. I won't tell you how long, right? But it's over 40 years, right? Um, sometimes you encounter someone in your youth and you just know that the job is not done, right? Um, there's a greater sharing to take place. Uh, when I started coming here all of nine years ago and um, saw Sandy, I said, okay, that's one of the things that was not completed. And you'll hear it in her message this morning because she does bring the best to the fore as far as this teaching is concerned. So please pay attention. Help me welcome, please. And her son is here with us this morning, Kevin. Please help me welcome our messenger this morning, Sandra Cooper. Thank you, Stevie, and thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all so much for, for being a part of my journey. It is truly a joy and an honor for me to bring you the message this morning. I'd also like to acknowledge all those of you who are listening to our broadcast on the World Wide Web. Welcome. Now, a few weeks ago, as I was flicking through my television channels trying to find something to watch, I came across the movie Horton Hears a Who. It's a Hollywood adaptation of one of children writers, Dr. Seuss's most well-known books. And if you remember some of his books, who can? Dr. Seuss, yes. Tell me one. The Cat in the Hat, and what else? Um, green Eggs and Ham. The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, and there are many, many more. At the center of the story is Horton, a caring elephant who lives in the jungle of Newell. Now, Dr. Seuss was very good at making up words. And in, in the, this jungle, Horton cavorts with the other animals. Now, one day, Horton, now he's a big creature in an elephant, but he has a large heart and a playful spirit. He hears a noise sounding like a cry for help coming from a tiny speck of dust floating past him. He finds it peculiar that a dust speck could speak, so he reasons that there must be a very small creature on it. Without being able to see the creature, he seems to know it is there and that it is his duty to save it from harm. After all, a person's a person, no matter how small. It is this and many other powerful words of wisdom laced throughout that got my attention as I watched this movie for perhaps the third or the fourth time. You know, confession, I love cartoons. And which inspired me to put pen to paper. And of course, it's summer. I mean, children are going off on holidays. And so summer suggests to me playfulness and fun and so on. So I thought I would make my lesson a little light this morning. And I give heartfelt thanks to Mr. Theodore Giesel, AKA Dr. Seuss. Although I discovered in the writing and the research that he pronounced his name rhymed with voice. So it's really Dr. Zeus. But I'll call him Zeus since that's what we all may know him as. And I've entitled my talk, Led by the Power of the Who Within You. Since publishing his first children's book in 1937, children and adults alike have been captivated by the charming and laconic tales of whimsical characters and imaginative worlds. But Dr. Seuss's stories are more than just catchy poems. They often wrestle with serious philosophical and moral dilemmas. And whether or not you see layered meaning in his fanciful works, his singular style of rhyme-centric storytelling, that has truly stood the test of time. But let's get back to Horton. Through patience and curiosity, Horton eventually learns that this little speck of dust houses a city named Whoville, that's W-H-O-V-I-L-L-E, and, and, and it's part of a whole new universe. 
He also learns that the voice belongs to the mayor of Whoville, whose biggest problem is finding time to devote to his 96 daughters and one son. Even though they cannot see each other and are in completely different and alien worlds, Horton and the mayor connect. Horton tenderly places a speck of, on a clover flower and sets out to find a safe place to reside. You'd think that this would be an easy enough task. However, when the other animals see their friend speak to the dust speck, they think, of course, Horton must be losing his mind, as they find it impossible to believe that anything or anyone could live on it, worse yet, a whole town. So Horton faces a formidable obstacle in Kangaroo, a do-gooder who winces when she learns that Horton believes he has made contact with a realm that he can't see or touch. Of course, Horton says to his friends, if you were way out in space and looked down where we live, we too would look like a speck, wouldn't we? It is this creative use of imagination that frightens Kangaroo. She worries that Horton will engage and encourage the children in the jungle to use their imaginations and live in a fantasy world. So in order to stop Horton, she arranges with a ragged and treacherous looking black-bottomed eagle called Vlad to get rid of the speck Horton is carrying around. Finally, after much perseverance and support from Horton, the tiny townspeople come together to make enough noise for the animals to hear, and the Who's are saved. That is W-H-O-S, because one of the members of the town is called a Who. So plural for Who is Who's. Okay. Now there are many, many wonderful lessons to be gleaned from this story, and I'll share a few of them with you along with some of the more salient themes in Dr. Seuss's work. The first one I have is hearing your who. Now imagine what would happen if you walked around Kingston <clears throat> hearing voices from little people that you couldn't see. Just, just picture it for a minute. I mean, there would be a const, I mean, we hear that constant whisper and if we were to sort of walk around and look like we are talking to somebody or something. Can you imagine what our friends and the people around us would think? Maybe it's a cell phone. <laughs> oh yes, when people have on the thing on the ear. Yes, got you. So it shouldn't be so, so strange, eh? <laughs> Yet the, the constant whisper of the still small voice of the divine is always there speaking to us through multiple channels and yes, in specks of dust. This is the who within you that resonates with and expresses as every living thing, seen and unseen. Author Neil Donald Walsh in Conversations with God, book one, puts it beautifully when he says, be on the lookout, listen. The words to the next song you hear, the information in the next article you read, the storyline in the next movie you watch, the chance utterance of the next person you meet, or the whisper of the next river, the next ocean, the next breeze that caresses your ear. All these are devices of mine, mine meaning God's. All these avenues are open to me. I will speak to you if you will listen. I will come to you if you will invite me. I will show you then that I have always been there for you, always. So this is God saying that it is in everything and in every expression of life and we need to listen. That is our who whispering to us on the speck of dust and on all other life forms. The second lesson is about taking charge. As the only one who can sense the who's plight, Horton doesn't have the luxury of leaving his responsibilities to someone else. He would have or could have chosen to walk away and leave Whoville to its fate. No one would ever have known. I mean, this is just a speck of dust. It could have just gone in the wind. Isn't that correct? Instead, our elephant hero steps up and accepts the task that's thrust upon him and sees it through in spectacular fashion. He doesn't wait for someone to tell him how to handle the situation or take over for him. He just stampedes onward through all the obstacles to see the job through. That determination and grit 
make Horton a wonderful role model as he follows through on his commitment to protect and save the Who's. He says, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. After all, an elephant's faithful 100%. Yeah. Where do you need to assertively take charge and take action in your life? What's stopping you? If the answer is fear, and that usually is what stops us, eh? Know that there is a divine presence and power that is there to guide and strengthen, inspire and provide. How can I be afraid, I tell myself, when I know that there is a perfect intelligence that guides and governs my every single act? Isaiah 41 verse 10 also reminds us, and I quote, to fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, and I will uphold you." End of that quote. The third lesson is how interconnected we are. As we look at this lesson, everything Horton does in the jungle of Newell has a huge ripple effect on the tiny people of Whoville. If he puts the clover into the shade, you know, the clover where the little speck rests, their sky goes black. If he breathes on it, their snow melts. Similarly, he can imagine his own larger world as just one more speck in a vaster galaxy, affected by an infinite array of seemingly small actions. Now, many of you may have seen pictures of maybe what the Earth looks like from as far away out of space as maybe the moon. We've seen those pictures, and it's a, a much, much smaller. Um, I mean, it just looks like a little far away speck. And when we look up into the stars and we see the little twinkle, we know that each one of those perhaps is a hundred million times the size that we can see. The truth is that we live in a unified field of energy that interconnects or interconnects everything. This means that literally the entire universe, every particle is conscious and it's exponentially evolving. Now, if everyone on the planet embraced this perspective-flipping truth, no, that's not an expletive, this perspective-flipping truth, because it's a truth that will flip your perspective, we'd be working for the benefit of each other as one global organism. Voices coming from a speck of dust would be nothing more than the bounty of the universe expressing in a new form. Can you imagine? And the fourth message to let people be who they are. The forces of conformity nearly prevail over those of imagination and self-expression. Because Kangaroo was hell-bent on stopping Horton and destroying that speck of dust. So why didn't Kangaroo and the other animals leave Horton alone to talk to little people on a microscopic speck of dust on a clover flower? Reverend Elma always said, and I remember who she was quoting, but what is it to thee? I think it was Jesus saying to his disciples when they, I think, complained to him about something. What is it to thee? Follow thou me. Letting someone be involves acceptance of who the person is. And it's allowing him or her to do things that may be different from your own actions. Yes, Kevin, I'm getting the message myself. Right? So um, afterwards, you can say to me now that I must walk my own talk. I get that. <laughs> um, the road to misery is paved with those of us who have set up unrealistic expectations of another, or what's worse, have tried to change their behavior thought. All we end up doing is becoming frustrated and feeling depleted of our positive energy and life force. Everyone has their own work to do. Yours is to focus on your life lessons and spend less time trying to improve upon others. Consider these most powerful gifts that you can give another. And these are three statements. I hear you. I understand you. I believe in you. If you can give those three gifts to someone who you care about. I hear you. I understand you. I believe in you. Now, Dr. Seuss's language is colorful and whimsical. 
His phrases and quirky ideas sound fun, even if you don't understand them. Yet he cleverly weaves and, you know, puts truth into his stories in a way that would parallel the work of any new thought author. For example, we know that we are made in the image and likeness of that which is perfect, whole, and complete, don't we? We have the ability to choose as well as access to a law that is awaiting our command, isn't that so? And that this law enables us to do or be anything that we imagine. Isn't that what we learn here? Now listen to how Dr. Seuss puts it. He says, you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. You are on your own and you know what you know. And you are the one who will decide where you go. He also captures the idea of our uniqueness and individuality when he says, today you are you, that is truer than true. There's no one alive who is youer than you. The idea of being fully self-expressed in spite of naysayers was the following message when he says again, be who you are and say what you mean because those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. Now the imagination is that faculty of mind that according to our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, awakens within us all the inner forces of nature and stirs into action latent powers which otherwise would never come to the surface. To say therefore that Dr. Seuss was an advocate for the use of the imagination would be an understatement. Who in his right mind would think up an elephant befriending a little creature called a who living in a town called Whoville, existing on a speck of dust? Isn't that wonderful? a wonderful expression of the imagination. Of course, we know that there really is no end to the outcomes we can create by channeling our thinking, is there? As Dr. Zhu said, think left and think right, think low and think high. Oh, the things you can think up if only you try. And that is T-H-I-N-K-S, not things. The things you can think up if only you try. This sounds to me like a call to possibility thinking. Because like a lump of clay can become a beautiful piece of pottery, we can look at anything and declare, it's not about what it is, it's about what it can become. Now the last lesson I want to share with you has to do with dealing with adversity. The recognition that we are made in the image and likeness of God, fully imbued with perfect life, gifted with wisdom and the power to choose means that we can rise above any adversity that might come our way. More so, through this teaching we are given the tool of spiritual mind healing treatment or affirmative prayer, which we can, we can use to knock any challenge out of the park, much like a big spiritual bat, eh? Listen to how Dr. Zeus takes on adversity. He says, I, I've heard that there are troubles of more than one kind. Some come from ahead and some come from behind. But I've bought a big bat and I'm all ready, you see. Now my troubles are going to have troubles with me. He advocates non-resistance as a way to deal with life's challenges, inviting us to go with the flow and watch how we rise. So that, and I quote, if things start happening, don't worry, don't stew. Just go right along and you'll start happening too. So it's the wisdom of our inner you that will come shining through. Oh geez, that sounds poetic. That's, those are my words. And then he says again, the storm starts when the drops start dropping. When the drops stop dropping, then the storm starts stopping. Let me say that one again. The storm starts when the drops start dropping. When the drops stop dropping, then the storm starts stopping. That sounds like a tongue, tongue twister, eh? So if you put it in the context of how some of us here in Jamaica love to drop word. Sometimes we let slip or we drop words of doubt and fear or anxiety. Then according to this, what, you know, what Dr. Zhu says here, when we drop those words, you know, I'm worried, I'm afraid, that's when the storm starts, that's when conditions start. So when we stop dropping those drops, 
the storm will indeed start stopping. So, I would like to now invite Kevin to just share with you a, a couple minutes as he um, just shares a little bit of his journey and specifically around this challenge of dealing with adversity. Kevin, welcome. Okay. Morning. Morning. Nice to see everyone. Um, I just want to open with three, I wouldn't say quotes because I didn't really memorize them, but just general statements that apply to the theme that is being tackled this morning. The first is, if you change the way you look at things, eventually the things you look at will start to change. Secondly, without struggle, there is no progress. Thirdly, courage is not acting when you're not afraid. Courage is acting when you are afraid. And I shouldn't be here by all technicalities, you know? And that's exactly why I am here, simply because of the fact that Adversity is in everybody's lives. It is a part of life, you know. Without adversity, you wouldn't be able to appreciate triumph, you know. When we have this heat, it makes us appreciate a glass of cold water that much more, you know. When you're around a blind man, you appreciate his sight a million times more. And one thing I've learned in my 36 years on this planet is rich, poor, black, white, no matter what culture you come from, there's always something that's going to be missing. That's life. That's the definition of life. We wouldn't be living if that wasn't the case. So when it's all said and done, things are going to happen, you know? And as bad as things happen to us, I guarantee you that there's somebody out there who is going through a way, way, way worse time. And they're still going. So who are we to slap them in the face and disrespect their perseverance by not leading by their example and by not you know, causing that to be a domino effect and going, OK, if they can do it, I can do it too. And let me spread that to my brother, man. I mean. The thing about me is I, I'm in California and I go out a lot and you know the population in California is 40 million people compared to Oracle 2 point something million. So the radius of people is a lot more, which can be overwhelming and scary and intimidating. Or it can be a thing to say, okay, more people I can reach, more people I can teach. More people I can inspire. Um, and I just go forward being that way and saying to myself, what would I want from somebody if I was in their position? You know, empathy is your best friend if you are a part of humanity. Because everything is connected, like has been stressed before. You know, we are our brother's keeper. And if we actually looked on the fact that our, per, our, you know, whatever we do will affect our brother and our brothers, whatever they do will affect us. And everything goes hand in hand. You know, we can't just be in our world all the time and be like, okay, it's our problems. We don't have any bills. I can't really worry about my neighbor right now and I have to pay my bills after dollars, you know. But at the end of the day, if disaster hits, you're going to need that very same neighbor. So, you know, look at it as insurance of the soul. When you take care of your brother, you're taking care of yourself, you're taking care of your family, you're taking care of your loved ones, you're taking care of your co-workers, you know, you're taking care of God. You know, and God put us here to manifest God. You know, it's 360 degrees, that's why you have night and day, that's why I have a wheel, that's why I have life, 
That's why you have death. That's why you have growth. You know, that's why you have all these things. And if we as people decide the only limit is the limits that we put on ourselves, then, you know, I wouldn't say sky is the limit because the sky has an end. I would say the limit is infinite and as long as you don't put a cap on it, the flow, despite the drought that we're physically in, is never ending. And no matter what happens, keep going. No matter how bad you think things are, could be worse. And most importantly, don't see what you don't want. And don't see who you don't want to be. See who you believe you are going to be. And eventually that's who you will be. God bless. Thank you, Kevin. I made sure I sort of I turned off the tap earlier so that nothing would happen of that way. Thank you so much. I think you, you know, what you said really fit into the message that I'm sharing. Now, Dr. Zhu says, now how did it get so late so soon? His wisdom tells us that the writer who breeds more words than he needs is making a chore for the reader who reads. So by extension, this, this must also be for the listener. So I'll hasten to end lest I send you to bed. Mine, mine. I invite you to consider adding the works of this great author to your collection. Indeed, the more that you read, the more things you will know. The more that you learn, the more places you'll go. That's his quote again. The reading is fun and the lessons are profound. Better yet, gift it to a child and commit to reading it to him or to her. As Dr. Zhu says, and I quote, you're never too old, too wacky, too wild to pick up a book and read to a child. There's a great and amazing world of possibility out there, a world that you can bring to life by your imagination and by the power of the who within you. My friends, you're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Say with me, and I'll just turn this around. I'm off to great places, today is my day. I'm off to great places, today is my day. My mountain is waiting, I am now on my way. My mountain is waiting, I am now on my way. So turn to the person next to you and share that. You're off to great places, today is your day. You're off to great places, today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. My final words will be, of course, from Dr. Seuss. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact. And remember that life's a great balancing act. And will you succeed? Yes, yes, you will indeed. 98 and 3 quarter percent. Guaranteed. <laughs> Namaste.